talking about Father. We, you know, we just celebrated Fathers today. We, we sort of honored them and sort of played fun and made fun of them. You know, Wanda made a joke about them. And, okay, and of course, we saw the dad jokes up there. But I sort of want you to sort of just sort of look at this picture for a second. I titled this message called Our Father's Eyes. And if you're a dad here this morning, I want you to sort of think about when you look at when you look at your child for the first time. You can probably can you just can you just remember uh, the amount of love that just sort of lumped up within you, and just how you just viewed your child. And honestly, if you think about it, e even though there may be times in your life that they've grown as they're growing up, there may be times in your life that they may disappoint you, they may make you mad, they may make you angry. But when you look at them. You still see him with a certain eye. You still see him with, with love and compassion. And you, and you just, you know, just these eyes. So I want to talk to you today about uh, this subject. But I want to talk to you about the most amazing father that there is. And to better understand this amazing father, we're going to look at a parable that Jesus told. It's a very, very familiar parable for most of us. He tells it in Luke chapter 15. It's most commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, before I get, before I say what I'm going to say, let me just sort of highlight this for you. What is a prodigal? We hear that term, a prodigal son. What is a prodigal? <coughs> In the verb usage, it means wasteful, wastefully or recklessly extravagant. In the noun usage, it is a person who spends or has spent his or her money or substance with. Wasteful extravagance. Others, they are a spendthrift. Uh, others, instead of being stingy, they just let it go. And then they always go to the extreme. Others, if they just can't just do it, just good enough. It's always got to be the, go to the extreme of everything. Okay? But, but of course, many times this is called the parable of the prodigal son. But the problem with this is this title puts the focus on the son, on the child. And if you know anything at all about this portion of Scripture here, at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus, He's actually addressing the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they're a little upset with Him. Because He's having dinner with tax collectors and other notorious sinners. And they're upset. You know, how in the world can He do this? Ah. You know, and he, He's basically letting them know why He came here. He came here to reach what? The lost. To seek and save the lost. And he begins to tell these parables about his mission, why he came. So he tells the parable of the lost sheep. He tells the parable of the lost coin. And now we see he tells this parable. So by using the term prodigal son, many times the focus seems to sort of be on the son. And all, and in all honesty, the focus should be on the father. And, and many other churches, like the Eastern churches, look at this and you know what they call it the parable of the good father. And that's what our, what our focus to be today. We want to focus on the father. Because it's obviously a better title for this entire parable, parable because it all revolves around the father. Yes, the son is spoken, but the son made mistakes. But we need we really want to focus on the actions and the behavior of the father this morning. And that's what I want to look at here pretty briefly. So let's sort of dive into this thing. In Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 12, this is what we're reading. Because again, this is the following the other two parables. And here's what it says. To illustrate the point farther, in other words, to, to help them understand what he's truly talking about, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The, the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. I'm going to tell you, before I go any further into this, him saying those words to the people listening to him, would have literally made them mad. It would have, it would have rocked their world. And you know, many times we're thinking, well, what do you mean? Um, because in all honesty, what the child was literally saying without him saying it was, I wish you were dead so I could have what's mine. Because because he was only supposed to get what was his when what? His father died, when his father passed on. And since he wanted it now, Really, what he was saying, I, I just, I wish you were dead so I could have what's mine. And I could go off some heavy theological things that are comparing us to this son, but, we'll, but we'll, we'll, you'll get there. <laughs> so I don't need to really stop and do that. 
So that he wanted his inheritance then. See, the wealth being divided here represents God's goodness. Just as his father divided his wealth to his two sons, God, our Heavenly Father, also allows his goodness to be upon everyone that is ever born. Because again, what the Bible tells us, God allows the sun to shine on the just and the unjust alike. He allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. But we must decide what we're going to do with his goodness, with what God gives us. So what did this son do with what was given to him? Verse 13 tells us, it says, And a few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. I mean, it, it's all pretty much all the credit they give to what he did. It's just one verse. But he wasted his money. His, he, he became a prodigal in how he spent his money. He didn't become a prodigal because he left home. He became a prodigal in how he handled what his father gave him. In many ways, we are that prodigal. We're not, you know, we're not a prodigal because we walk away from God. We're a prodigal in how we can be a prodigal in how we handle what God gives us. So I said that after this younger son receives his portion, he decides he's going to go and do with it whatever he wants. But understand this. When he decided to leave and just go where he wanted to go, his father did not take the wealth away from his son. He didn't try to take it away because the son wanted to do his own thing. See, many times we think that, that God's this big referee up in heaven that calls balls, strikes, and outs. And he's not doing that. He's made us, as Tom said, he gave us free will. He, give, he gives us these things, and it's up to us to decide what we want to do with these things. So just because his son decided he wanted to do something else, the father said, okay, well, I'm taking it back since you're not doing what I want you to do. But the father allowed him to do what he wanted to do with it. And that's the same way that God does with us. He does the same thing with us. But what was the result of this young man's decision? He wasted it all. But that's not where the story ends. And that's really not where I want to focus. See, I really don't want to focus on the sun, but I need to give you some background here this morning. I need to sort of build this up for you. In verses 14 through 16, it says, And about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the, ma and the man sent him into the fields to, keep him, to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods... He was feeding the pigs, looked good to him, and no one gave him anything. Now imagine this, that who's here ever seen pig slop? Who here would want to eat pig slop? Um, we, were, we were just uh, watching some, we were watching an Anne with an E the other day. And, uh, and, and, and it deals with this, it deals with Anne of uh, Green, Green Gable and all this, but a whole long story short, uh, she messed up, and, and her and her adoptive, or her aunt or whoever the person adopted said, "Well, just take it, put it in the, in the, in the trash stuff for the pigs." See, the pigs always get the leftover. The you know, they they really don't care what type of shape it's in, or what type of condition it's in, what it smells like. I mean, who's ever been near a pig pen? Do I see? Like, how many ever seen like, for instance, uh, when we when we first moved to White Hall, they were talking about building. Uh, on off of York Road at Whitebird um, Road. Somebody saw about putting a new development like across the street there where you first went to White Hall, down White Hall. So what this farmer did, since he didn't want that to happen, he purposefully put a pig farm right on the road. So if they were gonna so if they were gonna build the development there, they would smell the pigs. <laughs> and I tell you, he delayed that that for being built for almost 30 years. So to sort of tell you about a pig, let alone when you know, Jesus was talking to a Jewish crowd, and Jews avoided pigs at, you know, at all costs. It was considered the lowest form of thing you could do was, was dealing with pigs. But, uh, so when he's saying this, you know, in these Jewish minds are saying, this kid is desperate. That he's, you know, not only taking care of pigs, but eating pig slop. You know? But like I said, you know, wouldn't you know it that uh, just when his money ran out, that's when famine starts. And he finds himself in such a condition uh, 
that he's you know, getting ready to, uh, to eat, eat pigs. And see, and the thing, you know, he may have been generous, but or whatever, when he had money, but yet no one came, no one came to his aid. <clears throat> but we need to remember, this son got himself in this situation. Not the father; it wasn't the father's fault. The son got himself in this situation. Like I said it's pretty, you know, what he did to survive. Wow. But then the story continues. So the start in verse seventeen it says. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. So I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer, I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. When he realized his condition, when he truly realized, I, I mean, me, I think I may have tried to make the trek home a little sooner than what he did, but he finally got sick and tired of the condition he was living in. He began to remember the goodness of his father's house. He realized that his father's house wasn't maybe as bad or as restrictive or whatever as he thought it was, but there was plenty there. There was goodness there. There was rest there. There was peace there. But he had to do more than just think about his father's goodness. What did he have to do? He had to decide. He was going to so he's going to have to decide. He's going to leave his condition where he is and go and head back towards home. And when he decided that what his father had was truly better than what he had, he started on his journey. He started the trip. Because he truly got to a place where he had a repentant heart. But then we begin to read, and here's where the story picks up, and I sort of want to begin more so focus now. We're going to focus more, we're going to talk about it, but we're going to focus more on the Father. And it says, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him come. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead. And now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. See, what I want you to understand is the father did not wait for the son to make it all the way home. To when the father spotted him a long ways off, See, the father's eyes were every day, and I do believe every day the father was looking out across the horizon, looking across his land, whether he went to the roof of his house or whether there was another vantage point on the property of him. I think he went to the place where he could see the best and see the farther so he could keep an eye out and say, maybe today, maybe today my son will realize that I love him, and maybe today he'll, he'll just come home and just, so I, so I could just know he's okay and all this. But he was looking, he was scanning the horizon every day. And the thing is, the Bible tells us that when he saw him, a great way is off. See, he didn't wait. See, many times, see, sometimes we need to swallow our pride. He didn't wait for, for, for the son to get all the way home. He didn't wait for the son to grovel in front of him. But he ran after his son and he embraced him. And the son began to talk. And it's literally like it went in one ear and out the other. The father just basically ignored what he said because the whole time he was looking for his son to break over that hilltop, to come home so he could embrace his child once again. See, the father's eyes, when he saw his son, he didn't see him as a prodigal. He didn't see him as one who wasted everything that he gave him. He saw him as someone who was, who was dead and now came back to life. He saw him as someone who was lost, who, now need, who was now found. Someone he could once again wrap his loving arms around and share with him and let him know how much he loved him. Now again, it may say, I know sometimes, and sometimes we tell people, you've got to have tough love. And I, do, I know we have to have that sometimes. 
But when we truly know that they have a repentant heart, that's when time we, we need to open up. But the thing is, we need to be looking. We need to scan the horizon for them, looking for an opportunity to reach out to them. See, because, yes, the son, here's the one you understand. The portion of Scripture that tells us says, kill the fatted calf we've been preparing. I want to I suggest something to you. The day that son left his father's house, that father began to prepare that sacrifice. Oh, that would preach. The day that Adam and Eve fell in the garden and left the goodness of God, God began to prepare a lamb for his son. The fact is, we know that even before that happened, the Bible said before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was chosen to be the lamb that was slain. But God began, he began to reveal plan of redemption through that fatted calf, that fatted man. See, the father was already preparing for the return of his son before his son ever returned home. He started to prepare, he started to watch. And that truly does speak so much of our father in heaven. See, many times, you know, sometimes, even myself, I sometimes make a mistake and say, you know, all you have, how many times have you heard me say this, and that's says, all you have to do is take the first step, and God will take the rest. But that's actually wrong. God has already taken the first step. What we need to do is take the second step, and then he takes all the rest. See, because a lot of times when we say, well, we need to take the first step, you also work with the responsibility on ourselves. We need to say, God has already prepared for this. He's already, he's already lined up. He's already made plans for this. He's already taken the first step. All we have to do is just respond to his first step. And then all of a sudden he'll come. See, the Father already took the first step. Because he was already preparing for his son to one day break the crest where he could see his figure down the road. And all of a sudden he took off and shot out of the gun. And grabbed the hold of his son and said, let the party begin. Like I said, the father didn't wait for his son to make it all the way home, but he met him. See, when the eyes of the father saw his son, Greg went off, his eyes alerted him to run and meet his son to welcome him, him home. Like I said, his father didn't criticize him for wasting his possessions. His father was just glad that his son was home. Like I said, notice what the eyes of his father were doing. They were scanning the horizon for his wayward child. Each day, his eyes looked for his child's return. Like I said, when his child was before him, notice how his eyes viewed his son. They viewed him with love and compassion. See, it was this unconditional love of his father that was awaiting this son. But the story doesn't end there. It says in verse 25, it says, Meanwhile, the older son, while he was in the field's work, when he returned, when he returned home, he heard the music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, What was going on? Your brother's back, he was told, and your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older son was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. Told me to. And in all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes. You celebrate by killing the fatty calf. His father said to him, look here, son. You have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. 
For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. See, as with this father, so too God does not care where you've been, what you've done. He just wants you to come home to his house so he can embrace you in his own. See, that this older brother over thinking, well, maybe he's got what he deserved, you know? But unfortunately, too many times, this older son is like too many so-called Christians. And here's what I mean by that. They're not truly happy when a sin is saved. They're not even really looking for them to get saved because they may fear that God may bless them more than themselves. And what a pitiful condition that we have allowed ourselves to get into if we ever reach that place. But this is where we need our Father's eyes to see others the way that He sees them. We need to scan the horizon in our lives to look for wayward ones. To look for people who need to know who Jesus is and bring them to the Father. I'm going to close with a couple portions of Scripture here. Like I said, I hope, you know, I've been saying all throughout this, so I hope you truly understand that this story truly describes God and Heavenly Father. And that His eyes are truly scanning the horizon and waiting for you or he's waiting for you to take that second step. He's ready to, he's ready, willing, and, and ready to offer you his amazing love and amazing grace. He has already taken the first step by giving Jesus, which I explained earlier. Now he's waiting for you to take the next step. And as you move towards him, he will run and embrace you in his arms and restore you back to the place where you should be. See, God, God does not want to punish you. In fact, in all honesty, He doesn't. Did you hear me? God doesn't punish you. You choose it on your own. You know, he, as a parent sometimes, we can see our children having destructive behavior, especially if they get older. And some, you know, when they're in the house, sometimes there's a certain control we have while they live under our roof versus control we have after they're not under our roof. And even then, our, our control is only so much. But there are times where as much as you try to warn them, as much as you try to lead and guide your regular decisions, the bottom line is they must make the decision. And, and, and if they leave a destructive life that leads to ruin, there's nothing you can do to something now. As, as, as the parent, as the father, as the mother, you don't wish this upon your child. Because you wish for them to have a life that, that, that is good, that is pleasing. But, but they decide not to listen to what you're telling them. And they go do what they want. There's nothing you can do about it. Like I said, many times, understand this. What, the way things happen in the natural is many times the same way they happen in the spiritual. And God's not going to make you choose Him. So He doesn't really punish anybody with hell. See, that was an actual punishment that the Bible tells us for, for the devil, for the fallen angels. But the Bible also says that sin cannot dwell in His presence. You have to be holy to be in His presence. And if you decide to stay that way, you cannot be where He is. And you've got to go where, when it's all said and done, there's going to be one ultimate good place, which is going to be His kingdom. And there's going to be a place that's been reserved for the devil and His followers. And you solely decide where you go. God's made the way that you decide. Like I said, He's waiting for you to take the next step and move towards Him. Like I said, He will run and embrace you in His arms and restore you back to the place 
where you should be. Let me read something to you that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. Actually, see, go, go to, there's two versions there. there. There's the New Living Translation and the message. You see that? Just go, just pull up the message. Here's what Jesus said. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced, the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So Jesus is saying, you know, he's not telling you, see, for too long the church has portrayed this, this thing with Jesus, this life with Jesus, as a bunch of rules and regulations, and it's not it's a life of freedom. It's a life of dues. And not dues in where we have to do certain things, but where there's freedom where we can now live a certain way. We can now enjoy life to its fullest. Because too many times trying, trying to help people out the need of rules. And it's not about rules. It is about freedom. It is about love. And Jesus is offering this to you. And I want to end this message with this portion of scripture found in Isaiah 55. I'm skipping some things this year. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. It says, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish every evil thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes. Turn to our God, for He will forgive generously. Jesus is waiting. God the Father is waiting. Jesus paid the price. God the Father, He's waiting. He is looking out to see who will take the next step towards this love that He offers us. Like I said, this, Jesus, who was telling the story about this father, really, really good at describing what the Heavenly Father wanted to do with those who are away from Him. He's looking. He said, you may have wasted everything I've given you, but it's not too late. As long as you have breath, understand me this morning, as long as you have breath, it's not too late. To, to take a step towards God and him run to you and embrace you and restore you back to the position of being a child of God. But as with this son, you have to understand that you are destitute, that you are naked, that you are lost without him. That you, you need to understand the goodness and the rest and the peace of the Father. I'm not certain this is just And through this all, like I said, we need to get, these are the type of eyes that God has towards us. These, these eyes he has towards us never change. Like I said, when I was sharing earlier about how as a parent, if we see our children have destructive behavior, how that weighs on our heart, how that weighs on our mind. Don't you realize God the Father is the same way with Him? That's why Jesus came. That's why He had that whole plan there to begin with. And yet, you know, he, he's not he's not celebrating on him saying, Whoa, we got the draw, I kicked another one down. Yeah. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised that every person that stands before God, we do know that those are ready, you'll say, Well done, good faithful servant, enter to the joy of the Lord. But knowing that God you know, where, where do we get our emotions from? Where do they come from? Him. Anything we have came from Him. They gave people some one. Okay, Pastor, I got you here. What about evil? Evil is the lack of them. Okay. God is not evil. 
But I can truly see God the Father. Though an individual stand before him and he has to tell them, depart from me. I don't know you. Or go to the place that you chose to go. That literally tears would be falling from his eyes. Because he gave the grace because he knew again. And he pleaded with them time and time again. He, he pleaded with their hearts. He, he pricked their hearts. Yeah. 